Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Kambi Zranavardi, co-president of Columbia DC and graduate of School of Engineering in Applied Science. We are very honored to have uh, Claudia Kalb, best-selling author and journalist with us uh, this evening to talk about her uh, most recent book, Spark, How Genius Ignites from Child Prodigies to Late Bloomers. Claudia is an award-winning author and journalist who reports on health, science, and human behavior. Her first book, Andy Warhol, was a hoarder inside the minds of history's great personalities, was a 2016 New York Times bestseller. A former senior writer at Newsweek, Claudia has written hundreds of features over three decades on topics ranging from mental health and genetic testing to memory and creativity. Her most recent magazine features include a series of cover stories for National Geographic on the origins of genius. She lives with her family in Alexandria, Virginia, and you can read more about Claudia's work at www.claudiacalb.com. Uh, we will share that website again uh, through, through chat. Uh, so without further ado, Claudia, it's all yours. Hello, uh, Kambiz, thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak um, to Columbia tonight. I'm just thrilled to have this opportunity. Uh, I thought I would tell you a little bit about my project, my work on genius, and also I'm gonna show you some images. Um, I think the photographs will give you a sense of my reporting. I wanna take you behind the scenes of what it's like to report on genius. And throughout the evening, I'm going to blend together science and history, psychology, biography, to talk about moments of creativity, inspiration, discovery, and genius in the lives of 13 iconic figures. So I'm going to start with my PowerPoint. As you can see, this is the cover of my new book, which Cumbies mentioned, um, Spark, How Genius Ignites from Child Prodigies to Late Bloomers. This book is kind of a journey um, from beginning, really way back in, in childhood when I wondered what I might become. Um, and I've always been interested in what sparks people, what determines the arc of a person's life, uh, and what changes it. My own journey to becoming a journalist was somewhat of a zigzag. I studied pre-med in college. I thought about law and psychology, uh, but I've long been interested in how and when people find their way. I was fortunate to land the genius beat um, at National Geographic, which started with a series of stories about genius uh, for the magazine. This picture was taken at a newsstand in Cambridge um, where I arrived and was uh, delighted to see this bookazine, it's called, it's, it's a large magazine, looking at the science of genius um, over time and history. And I'm gonna talk about a lot of the elements I cover in that um, issue and the elements of genius and what genius is and what I learned really on my discovery. These are the three stories I wrote for the magazine um, that led me to this book. A story about genius, the origins of genius, the science of genius with Einstein on the cover. A story about Picasso and the arc of his life from prodigy. How did he sustain himself as a genius? He lived to 91. How did he not burn out like so many prodigies do? And then Leonardo, a story uh, celebrating the 500th anniversary of Leonardo's death in May 2019. Obstacles cannot crush me, Leonardo once said. He who is fixed to a star does not change his mind. It was really Leonardo who got me hooked on the story of genius. I went to the town of Vinci, which is in the Tuscany Hills. You see that um, image taken from a few kilometers above town. This is where Leonor Leonardo was born in the spring of 1452. And you're looking down there through olive trees um, from the top of the hills. There you see the historic center of Vinci, and near that tourist shop is the church where Leonardo was said to be baptized um, more than five, some 500 years ago. More than 500 years after his death, it's really remarkable the way Leonardo's legacy lingers. Thousands of people come to see this place, this town of Vinci, every year. Why? What does Leonardo still offer us today, and what does genius really mean? 
with Leonardo, genius covered so much ground, but it was in essence his skills at observation and his boundless curiosity, a hunger for knowledge, an unparalleled ability to observe, to interrogate, to visualize the world. Leonardo left behind tens of thousands of sketches compared to fewer than two dozen paintings. We know the Mona Lisa so well and The Last Supper, but it was his sketches where Leonardo really um, showed his incredible uh, visual skills, his artistic skills, and the way his mind worked. He leaped from subject to subject, from botany to biology, geology, hydraulics, architecture, military engineering, cartography, optics, anatomy, one subject to the next. Every time Leonardo made an observation, it invariably led to a question or a pondering. Describe the cause of laughter, he wrote in a note to himself. What separates water from air? What's the distance from the eyebrow to the junction of the lip and the chin? One Leonardo expert, Paolo Galuzzi, told me in Florence, he went sideways. Learning about Leonardo, of course, raises questions about genius. When is it, what is it, how and when does it emerge? And how can we incorporate and learn from genius, incorporate some of those elements into our own lives? My reporting took me to places where genius resides, including the Nobel Museum in Stockholm. You see on the right, those pages at the top, it's a circulating um, kind of a machine that um, goes around and as you're in the museum and you stand there, each page tells the story of a Nobel winner and circulate through the museum, now almost 1,000 Nobel Prize laureates. It's quite breathtaking. The brief history of genius, hard to say brief, <laughs> uh, goes back centuries. It's complicated. It's so messy. It's so difficult um, to tease apart. So what I'm giving you tonight is really a um, beginner's lesson on what I learned about genius through dozens and dozens of interviews and trips. Um, to report on it. In the beginning, the focus was on the physical characteristics of eminence. So Hippocrates talked about the bodily humors and black bile, apparently in his mind, endowed the poets and philosophers and others with higher powers. Cranium craniometrists collected skulls, measured them, analyzed bumps on the head. In 1869, Francis Galton published Hereditary Genius, a report on the, the lineages of famous Europeans and how genius appeared to transfer down the bloodline. This led to um, the nature versus nurture debate. It opened um, the very difficult story of eugenics, but it's always been a question in the study of genius, how much of it comes through from, from through DNA, through um, a person's life history. Intelligence as measured by the IQ test is often considered the yardstick of genius. But interestingly, a decades long study of students who had high IQs um, recruited uh, out at, by a researcher uh, out at Stanford University launched in the 1920s found that some of these students who came in as children with these very high IQs triumphed, um, but others succumbed to the foibles of human life. Some st struggled with addiction, others dropped out of school. And two who didn't make the cut for the IQ study grew up to win Nobel Prizes, Luis Alvarez and William Shockley. The elements of genius as distilled very, very simply. Um, intelligence, but not necessarily IQ. This might be some other kind of intelligence, musical or interpersonal. Creativity, some imagination, the way one thinks broadly and is open to experience. Persistence, um, perseverance, grit, resilience, all of those things that give somebody the intensity and drive to move forward. Um, and then luck, simple good fortune, which may appear in the guise of a, um, a parent who teaches and cultivates, um, a mentor who takes somebody under his or her wing um, and, and sort of parachutes them or, or catapults them um, to uh, success. This picture, by the way, is an apple growing on what um, the people at Woolsthorpe Manor, which is Isaac Newton's home in rural England, um, believe is the Newton apple tree. Well, I'll get more into that in a little bit, but that's a close-up of one of the apples growing on this tree in um, the garden 
It's a flower of Kent variety. And as the guide told me, um, it can be described as either an eater or a cooker, <laughs> which probably means it's not very good at either. As Kambi's mentioned, um, my first book, Andy Warhol Was a Hoarder, um, also plays into the work about genius. In this book, I investigated the psychology of great minds and the ways in which the spectrum of mental health conditions can affect people um, in sometimes a positive way. Uh, George Gershwin, you see there, um, psychiatrists today think that it's possible if he were alive as a child today, he would be tested for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And yet it was that same energy and sort of pulsating, um, lively, pushing of um, forward that contributed, I think, to the music um, that he created. Betty Ford, who struggled with addiction, she was very, very, very open about um, and served to help others. Charles Darwin, his anxiety may have propelled his perfectionism and thus the achievements he made in his science. As I worked on these various elements um, of my work, I became interested in how these elements of genius play out and why moments of discovery happen at different times for different people, early, midlife, and late life. And I delve into this subject in Spark, and you can see here, the, these are all the people I profile in the book with ages under each, which is sort of a rough age at which that person um, found their moment, became known for something. Um, beginning with Picasso, Shirley Temple, and Yo-Yo Ma's prodigies, midlifers, including Julia Child, Maya Angelou, Alexander Fleming, people who achieved momentous things in their 30s and 40s, um, not necessarily um, finally achieving something at that point, but perhaps even reorienting their lives in, in new ways in their middle years. And then late bloomers like Peter Mark Roger and Grandma Moses, uh, people whose lasting achievements took place at age 50 and beyond. There's some good news here, in fact, on older blooming. Um, despite the focus on wonderkins, which we hear about all the time, 30 under 30, um, new research shows that being older is not necessarily detrimental to achievement. And in fact, in some cases can help. Nobel Prize winners are trending older. They used to be two thirds of them under the age of 40. And now the average age is 48. I like the story of John Goodenough, um, Nobel Prize winner just recently, who won at 97 for co-inventing the lithium ion battery. And he told the New York Times, some of us are turtles. We crawl and struggle along and we haven't maybe figured it out by the time we're 30, but the turtles have to keep on walking. The first chapter in the, in the book is, is Picasso. And um, I'm going to take you on a tour of each of the uh, people in the book, each of those uh, photographs that you saw became a profile, um, a chapter in the book, and tell you a little bit about the themes that emerged. Picasso, I had the great fortune of traveling to Malaga, Spain. You can see it on the map there on the coast um, where Picasso was born in that yellow building in one of those rooms and where he played in the dirt in that courtyard to the right on that panorama shot. Um, played in the dirt and drew his first sketches in the dust. He had all of the elements, um, a family that cultivated his passion and his talent, an intellectual curiosity and an unbelievable grit. And he was born at a time when new ideas in science and literature and music were energizing his work, also had mass media emerging, which catapulted him to fame. Above all, he was a risk taker. He was brave and he didn't care what people thought of his work. He overturned convention in his art. I interviewed Picasso's grandson, Bernard. You can see him in the top left corner um, at the museum in Malaga dedicated to Picasso's work and was very struck by something he told me about the influences that shaped Picasso's early life. Um, the collisions of civilizations and faiths in Malaga Phoenician, Roman, Jewish, Moorish, Christian, Spanish, the colors of the trees, the jacaranda flowers, the purple, the beige stones at the theater and the palace, and the smell of the oranges. All of those senses, Bernard told me, influenced and enriched and nourished Picasso's mind. He also had a remarkable memory and ability to pull these memories and to pull elements of experiences from his mind at all times throughout his life. 
life to shape his art. It's difficult to study prodigies in science because there are so few, uh, but several characteristics have emerged specifically among art prodigies, an acute visual memory like Picasso's, a remarkable attention to detail, an ability to draw realistically early on. One of the researchers I spoke to, Ellen Winner at Boston College, um, coined a phrase that I think speaks to the unique energy of prodigies. She said they have a rage to master. It, at an early age are consumed by some kind of interest or passion and they cannot stop doing it. You have to pull them away to get them to eat breakfast or go to school. It's, an, it's a rage to master. The more they do, the better they get. Picasso clearly had it. There's the importance of timing in genius, in the work of genius. And I use genius in the book, um, and I will tonight, in a way to, um, I stretch it a bit. I talk about it, not necessarily as genius in capital letters um, equated to Einstein, but genius in a form that might be a genius idea, um, a genius um, moment. Um, Shirley Temple is somebody who we all know started dancing very young at the age of three. She had a she had a bright energy. She had a talent. She too, as a prodigy, had an attention attention to detail. In her case, emerging as an ability to focus and concentrate. She learned where to stand and how to hold her face on stage by sensing the warmth of the stage lights on her face. Something she learned very very early in life. Between 1934 and 38, she was the number one top box office draw, bigger than Clark Gable, Fred Astaire, and Ginger Rogers. But she was also lucky in her timing. She was the antidote to the Great Depression. The remarkable thing about Shirley Temple is she didn't burn out. Her life continued. Many child prodigies do. They're unable to cope with the demands of life outside of their specialty. They're isolated from peers early in life which denies them the ability to learn social skills and integrate. Shirley Temple's trajectory was remarkable. She was a prodigy and a midlifer. I met two of her children, Susan and Charlie, in her home in the hills of Northern California, and uh, they told me about the other phases of her life, the second and third phase beyond the child act actress. Um, she was wife to Charlie Black and a mother to them. And then the third act, as a diplomat, um, she served as a UN de delegate. She was appointed ambassador to the Republic of Ghana by President Ford in 1974 and ambassador to Czechoslovakia by President Bush in 1989. Those same skills, those, those theater skills that she learned early on in her life translated to the world stage. Um, her genius was not only her abilities as a prodigy film star, but in her ability to take those skills and navigate the world using them, and in her authenticity and in her optimism. She had a very optimistic uh, outlook on life, her ability to put um, the past behind and move forward every day. This speaks to that, that earlier element I mentioned of grit, that, that resilience, stick-to-itiveness, Shirley Temple had that. Yo-Yo Ma, uh, a wonderful prodigy, an example of a contemporary musician who um, brings joy to the world. I had the privilege of interviewing Yo-Yo Ma and watching him play in Tanglewood during a worldwide tour, which he is still finishing now and completing, where he plays box cello suites and meets with communities around the world. When I asked Yo-Yo Ma about his childhood, he started talking immediately and very energetically about how important it was that he was an immigrant. This was critical to shaping his life and his music. He was born to Chinese parents in Paris and came to the US the year he turned seven. He had good fortune in that his parents were musical. His father was a violin teacher and a violinist. His mother was a singer. He was taught to play by his father, taking complicated musical passages and studying them in parts. But again, the, the risk with prodigies always is burnout. And Ma, as he grew up in the United States and figured out that all of these, these different cultures that he learned um, from his early childhood in Paris, from his Chinese parents and upbringing, to what he um, suddenly was immersed in in the United States when he came out, 
came in, all of that contributed to an open and desire to be open to new experience, an immigrant outlook, um, new starts, new changes in a sense that there's always something that can be learned. We must keep ourselves open to opportunity. So Ma, when he was college age, chose not to go to Juilliard, not to limit himself to music. He went to Harvard where he studied Russian literature, anthropology, sociology, French civilization. He met people who were different. He met plenty of people who were not musicians. Um, and he learned a, a, a desire um, to engage with people and to study beyond just the cello. You can see here he uh, in the photo on the left, he's playing um, in the white at the White House for President and Mrs. Reagan and Crown Prince Akito and Crown Princess Michiko in 1987 when he was in his early 30s. He played for President Kennedy when he first came to the United States as a child. He's played for countless presidents. But Ma at 49 talks about how he realized his true passion is, is people. Uh, he had never chosen music in the way it had chosen him. And um, he now travels the world engaging, as I mentioned, currently in this Bach tour where he plays Bach cello suites but also uses his music as an entree into a community to talk about ways to raise awareness about important projects, whether they're in environmental science or um, arts, um, even issues that have to do with poverty, drug addiction. This picture was I took in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where he engaged in a community event with groups of people um, and then talked to them about the issues challenging the city of Pittsfield how to overcome these issues of, of addiction and poverty. He has a relentless optimism um, and his genius is in the way he uses that optimism and that openness to, to new experience, to build bridges throughout the world, to spotlight important efforts throughout the world that don't have the name that he does. Um, he described it to me as if his cello is what he brings like stone soup, the children's fairy tale, where everybody brings something that they have to offer, and his is the cello. Another chapter in the book, Bill Gates, this uh, shows you very quickly um, Bill Gates' risk-taking um, quality. This photo was taken in 1977. It's a, it's a mugshot. Um, he, was, he used to speed around um, somewhat recklessly when he was building Microsoft in Albuquerque. Um, he had a real um, sense of, of risk of um, looking boldly toward the future. Um, interesting aspect and theme to his life that I discovered is this idea of collaboration, that we often think of genius as a solitary pursuit, the lone genius, um, but it's truly a myth because great minds always build on um, knowledge that comes before them or collaborate with others as they develop. Um, Bill Gates's intelligence is, is indisputable, but when I interviewed him over email during the pandemic, he told me about how important his parents' support was in his life. They were his earliest collaborators. They got him to a school um, that engaged his mind where he discovered computers. At the school, he met Paul Allen with whom he would go on to form Microsoft. And then he joined forces with Melinda Gates and later with investor Warren Buffett. He's always worked in partnerships with people and they've sustained him. I, th I find collaboration a fascinating theme of genius. And if you think about, I mentioned George Gershwin earlier, the Gershwin brothers, the Wright brothers, uh, one of my favorites, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who worked together to promote women's rights. Anthony was sort of the leader, Stanton was the thinker and the writer. And after Stanton's death in 1902, Anthony said that the greatest pleasure of their working partnership was, quote, when she forged the thunderbolts and I fired them. Isaac Newton, um, almost impossible to leave out of any series on genius. There's a plaster cast you see there of his name, which apparently was his own signature found at the King's School in um, Grantham that he attended north of London. Newton's story is about his unwavering intellect. Um, his mother had hoped he would tend to the land at the family estate, which is, there's the home, Woolsthorpe Manor, which is north of London in a very beautiful rural area. Um, his father and his grandfather were farmers, but Newton was hopeless at the task. The sheep wandered off, the cattle 
trampled the corn. And uh, fortunately, the schoolmaster and an uncle saved him from this <laughs> undertaking and got him off to Cambridge. It, it, focusing too heavily on ideas is actually not always a good thing. It's not the way to spark genius necessarily. And this is true in Isaac Newton's case. Uh, the bubonic plague hit in 1665 and Newton, like so many students today with COVID, was forced to flee, leave, go home. He went to Woolsthorpe Manor where he did early experiments with a prism in his bedroom leading to his observations on light. He pondered laws of motion, gravity, optics, all of the things that would later be published in his works. Another sort of myth um, of genius is that the Eureka moment is something that comes out of the blue. And you see there the apple garden and that tree in the middle you saw earlier, the fruit, that's the tree um, that the people at Woolsthorpe Manor have dated to the time of Newton. This tree was, um, was fell during a storm and rerooted and grew again. It's, it's, it's dated to about 400 years old. Um, the apple did not hit Newton on the head, as I'm sure most of you <laughs> know, but he did describe sitting underneath the tree in his garden, watching an apple drop and contemplating the, the idea that something made that happen. The same gravity that pulled the apple to the ground also held the moon in orbit around the earth. Eureka moments don't come out of nowhere. They emerge after contemplation, often on a walk or in a shower. And for Newton, it was this time away from Cambridge, away from the students and the pressures of university. He was there for about 18 months on his own. And it was there at this time that he, he had the, the opportunity to really forge his mind. There's an interesting piece of science I discovered while looking at Eureka moments. Um, two scientists, John Cunius and Mark Beeman, have reported that when you do have a burst of, mo of a moment, a burst of an idea that comes after contemplation, that it originates in the right cerebral hemisphere of the brain, and it's preceded by what they call a brain blink. So this is a quick period when your brain blinks the way your eyes blink to, to keep out distractions. Your brain blinks to keep out distractions so you can focus inward, and the moment is allowed to come forth. I was interested in looking at contemporary genius in business, the idea of entrepreneurs and how do they emerge. Um, this is Sarah Blakely. She's the founder of a company called Spanx. She was a kid in Florida in the 70s who couldn't keep still. She grew up with a trial lawyer father and an artist mother, a father who told her that failure was imperative she must fail. Um, he would be disappointed if she didn't fail, whatever it might be, whether running for class president or um, taking a test that she needed to experience failure. And failure is a critical part of genius um, or any success. We must all fail to move forward. Um, one interesting science study on failure found that kids who studied the personal struggles of famous people like Einstein showed more improvement in their grades over time than kids who learned only about successes. We need to fail to understand the pathways um, that we pursue. Failure for Blakely was such an accepted part of her life that when she failed, as she says, the LSAT, she thought she would follow her father into law. Um, she decided she would just go out on her own. And at age 25, to start, decided she wanted to start a business though she had no idea what that business would be. Age 27 found her idea when she decided to cut the pantyhose, the, the feet off her pantyhose, so she could wear them under a pair of white slacks um, to smooth herself out. And she started this company, a shapewear company called Spanx, with just $5,000 and to this day has had no investors um, helping her out. So no business school, no business knowledge, complete grit and determination. And I think her story is one of intentionality. And I think this comes up a lot in um, entrepreneurs especially, but also really applicable to any of us, the idea that um, you are intentional about a goal. You don't, you don't just ride the journey as it goes. You forge the journey and you're intentional about what you want to do. She's also intentional about courage. She has a lot of fears um, and, and that, that really can hold her back, but she says she chooses courage. And here she is um, mentoring other women entrepreneurs, which is something um, she has been determined to do. 
Julia Child is a wonderful story of um, just serendipity and also determination and authenticity. Um, Chance played a significant role in, in Julia Child's life when she had her first meal, French meal at La Caronne in Rouen, France in 1948, when she was 36 years old. Her husband, Paul, had gotten a new job in Paris at the US Information Agency and they landed um, off the boat to the first meal. She got a whiff of buttery shallots and fresh lemons and uh, the oysters, the smell really inspired her. She began to learn to cook at the Cordon Bleu Culinary Institute and then spearheaded the publication of Mastering the Art of French Cooking. Um, which was a project she took on as if a scientist, measuring and testing everything to the point that the first draft of that book was 800 pages long. Um, it wasn't until she was 50, though, that Julia Child launched the TV show that really made her a celebrity, The French Chef. And Julia Child seized midlife with all its imperfections. She was authentic in the way she came off on television. She was schmaltzy. She was funny. She was irreverent. She would pat her ribs and, and wave her rolling pin around. And she admitted to the flubs, um, including a fa famous potato pancake flip that landed on the floor. She had an I can do attitude that seemed to energize the people that watched her. And this kept her going. She had an unwavering energy. And this was another element of genius that came up in, in pretty much everybody I've studied. Um, it's this energy, this font that keeps going, whether um, into late at night or into the last years of life. Um, she timed her naps to eight minutes. She had dinner after day-long day events that, that took forever, including one where she insisted on an expansive meal starting at about 10.30 and ending with a fully caffeinated cup of coffee. The year she turned 79, she launched a, de a gastronomy degree program at Boston University with Jacques Pepin, and she had plans for a dinner party for her 92nd birthday. She died just two days before. She said, when you rest, you rust. When you stop, you drop. Her lesson was really, you must keep going. Maya Angelou, uh, born in 1928, the same year as Shirley Temple, very different early life. Uh, her parents could not care for her. She was raised by her grandmother amidst poverty, racism in the Jim Crow South and Stamps, Arkansas. She endured rape at the age of eight. And we know from studies in science that trauma can of course break a person, can lead to incredible difficulties later in life, but in some people, it can also mold a striving for achievement and accomplishment. And Maya Angelou chose hope and courage. She called herself a contrived optimist. It wasn't easy. She made it happen. When she was young, she took work where she could get it, including singing Calypso um, and dancing. Um, she started writing poetry and moved to New York at the age of 31 to join the Harlem Writers Guild. She was an activist. She worked with Martin Luther King. She moved to Africa where she became a journalist and took in the dialects um, that surrounded her. All of these in experiences, the difficulties and the experiences informed her life. And there came a moment, the moment was April 4th, 1968, when she got news of Martin Luther King's assassination. She had been that very day, it was her birthday, she had been preparing a birthday dinner with ham and candied yams and pineapple cake. And she got a knock on the door. Um, she got a phone call about the assassination and then a knock on the door a few days later from her friend James Baldwin, who said, you must come out. She had been essentially in hiding, could not handle um, the horrific news of what was going on around her, Martin Luther King and all of the other agonies of the time. He took her out that night, just a few days after the assassination to a dinner party or a dinner event with Jules Pfeiffer, the cartoonist in New York City and his wife, Judy, a book editor. And during this evening, Maya Angelou told her life story and all of its raw, difficult elements. And Judy listened to the story and called her friend, an editor named Robert Loomis, and said, she's got a book in her. And after numerous attempts, 
by Robert Loomis, Maya Angelou agreed to write her first memoir at the age of 40. It was published when she was four, the year she turned 41. I know why the caged bird sings and propelled her career. The question always arises in the study of genius and in any kind of accomplishment, is it talent or is it practice? The idea that being that if you practice enough, you can achieve success. And this is often touted as a, as a way, so many hours will get you to this kind of level of achievement. But Maya Angelou was always the first person to emphasize the importance of hard work. She wrote for hours every day, stretched out on a bed, writing on a legal pad, so much so that she developed calluses on her elbows. And she bridled when people said, you make it look easy. Your writing is so easy. And she said, those are the ones I wanna grab by the throat and wrestle to the floor. It was not easy. It was so hard. But I think in Angelou's case, there was this talent and hard work that came together. She clearly had this ear for language, a spirit and a voice, a voice that she used throughout her life to tell stories. Between the age of 40 and her death in 2014 at 86, she completed three books of essays, numerous volumes of poetry and seven memoirs, the last published the year she turned 85. Alexander Fleming, the scientist, um, discovered penicillin in 1928. I visited his lab on a trip to London. You can see there the Petri dishes lit by the sunlight. Those, some of those are the original dishes of, of Fleming's. Um, it's a museum now made to look like it did on the day of his discovery. The newspaper in the lower left is dated September 3rd, 1928, which was the day Fleming came back from, from a summer holiday and noticed something funny in one of his Petri dishes. Um, there was something had dropped into the dish, a mold that had somehow forced the bacteria in the dish to, to, to rush to one side. The mold had some power um, against this bacteria. It was not Fleming's first discovery. He had discovered a antibacterial agent far less known called lysozyme several years before that which prepared him to notice that when he saw this dish, something similar was going on. The first discovery lysosome did not have a powerful effect on bacteria, um, but the second one, this one, that would be named penicillin, did. His discovery happened when he was 47, but it was his experience, his tenacity, his patience, his acquired knowledge and wisdom that allowed him to stop that day and say, this is important. Many other scientists probably would have put that dish aside or thrown it away, might not even have left the dishes out to potentially accumulate this strange mold. But Fleming did, he was always waiting for something to happen. He was primed for discovery. He also worked at a time and place that this was another element of luck in his life where he was allowed to veer off course in his study he was allowed to leave those dishes out to see what happened. He really bemoaned years later when he saw the sterile polished labs that were being built um, and wondered had he, had he been working in that kind of situation, would he have himself discovered penicillin? The breakthrough led to worldwide recognition. He was knighted by King George VI. He shared a Nobel Prize in 1945 and saved the lives of millions of people even now but he was a modest man and he said throughout his life, you must leave your, your work open to chance. You do not know what you will find, he said. You may set out to find one thing and end up discovering something entirely different. Elmer Roosevelt, um, genius sometimes emerges from difficult paths. I certainly saw that with Maya Angelou um, for Eleanor Roosevelt, resilience from a difficult childhood played also an enormous role in her life. She was born to privilege in 1884, but by the time she was 10 years old, she had lost both parents. Her father was an alcoholic, Elliot, her mother, Anna, died young, and she lost one of her two younger brothers. She was, she was taken to her grandmother's house, house to be raised with her surviving brother, always some feeling insecure, not feeling confident, not feeling like she really had her own identity. 
when she was 15, she went off to boarding school in England, and this was her moment. This was when she met Marie Suvestre, who was the head of the school, who recognized in Eleanor a bright and lively mind and energy and intellect, and she cultivated it. She was Eleanor Roosevelt's most important early mentor, and she took her on trips to Europe. And when Eleanor Roosevelt went back then to the United States, she came back with, with more experience and with more of a, um, of a hope for her life than she'd had prior. And when she was 20, she married 23-year-old FDR. She was 33 when she learned that FDR was having an affair with her social secretary, Lucy Mercer. She was 48 when FDR was elected to his first term as president in 1932. I think Eleanor Roosevelt really evolved during FDR's time in the White House. She became his eyes and ears, famously going down into the mines, speaking her own mind, um, learning her own voice. She resigned from the Daughters of the American Revolution when they wouldn't let Mary and Anderson sing there. She became outspoken about causes and continued to develop over those years that began really in midlife. She had courage and resilience which she drew on repeatedly throughout her life. She said, courage is more exhilarating than fear. And in the long run, it is easier. She said, you just have to do things one step at a time. The science on resilience is fascinating. Uh, one study looked at children who grew up um, and watched their characteristics as they, as they grew from difficult circumstances and found that the kids who established close bonds with at least one caregiver and also found emotional sustenance outside their family when necessary, did better. They had this outside resource, which she had in this teacher. Um, and interestingly, girls who took care of younger siblings seemed to develop a sense of responsibility and independence that nurtured their resilience. And Eleanor had this with her surviving brother, Hall, who she helped to raise. Resilience isn't a personality trait, it's a dynamic process that builds over time. It's people build resilience by actively seeking opportunities. I think the traumas in Eleanor Roosevelt's life imbued her with empathy and her genius seems to me to be in the way that she offered this to others in a straightforward and non-sanctimonious way. And her achievements continued to pile on. In 1946, she was appointed US representative to the UN and in her early 60s, she spearheaded, spearheaded the passage of the UN Declaration from, of Human Rights, which was one of her proudest achievements. This is her home, Valkyll in New York, which was her favorite place to go, to relax, to visit with her family and world leaders. She sat in that nook in the back of the living room, in the photo at the bottom with, with JFK when he tried to get her on board for his uh, campaign to be president. She did campaign for Kennedy in, the, in her 70s. She took on a teaching job at 75. And by the time of her death at 78, she really had become a global humanitarian, somebody who didn't start out a prodigy early in life, but who evolved over the course of her life. Her grandson, David, said she just did what she had to do. There was no resting on her laurels. I like this quote um, by Eleanor. Uh, we are constantly advancing like explorers into the unknown which makes life an adventure all the way. How interminable and dull that journey would be if it were on a straight road over a flat plain, if we could see the whole distance without surprises, without the salt of the unexpected, without challenge. This is the woods outside of Valkyll, her home, and you can see Eleanor's walk the loop. She tended to take this one favorite loop through these woods with her grandchildren, listening to their stories and thinking through her thoughts. This is Peter Marc Roger, a fascinating story of discovery, childhood passion rediscovered. Uh, he was a successful scientist, but in childhood had, had always loved notes and words. He began filling a notebook with Latin words when he was a kid and, and organizing them. Went to medical school, became a scientist and inventor, a successful one. He invented a slide rule. He documented an optical illusion that contributed to movie making. He wrote a treatise on animal and vegetable physiology that spanned a thousand pages. But in his early 70s, when he had retired from medicine, Roger came back to words. 
he turned to compiling his famed thesaurus, which he had sort of started roughly when he was in his childhood around age eight, and then worked on again in his 20s when he wasn't at work. Biographers like to call his writing, his own writing was ponderous and priggish, but he was an incredible organizer. He drew on the work of botanist Carl Linnaeus, who organized nature into domains and kingdoms and phylas. Roger did this with words, creating this thesaurus, which now has sold some 40 million copies worldwide. I like Roger's story not only because I was an English major <laughs> who spent much time with actual hard copies of Roger's thesaurus, but because genius is defined by the impact you leave behind. And Roger, who died in 1869 at the age of 90, left us words. The final profile in the book is Anna Mary Robertson Moses, who we all know as Grandma Moses. Um, she's a story of serendipity and also purpose and grit. Uh, she's the quintessential late bloomer. I think it's fair to say we're familiar with her paintings, the sort of whimsical, nostalgic images of farm life and sleigh rides in the snow and the tapping of maple trees. Uh, Moses painted what she knew, the beauty of life throughout the season. She had grown up in a farming family. She married a farmer. She raised five children. Um, saw another five die in infancy. She kept busy. And um, just as I think Julia Child's middle-agedness was critical to her appeal, Moses's life experience, the, the years she spent working on the farm and in nature and observing these landscapes and being a mother informed her art. She needed to live the life before she painted it. This is her house on the upper left, which I went to see. Her great-grandson lives there now, who's also a folk artist. Um, he still remembers his great-grandmother. He told me he used to ride his bike over her molasses cookies and remembered also when she one day moved her studio into the laundry room because she was tired of all the visitors who came up to see her and she didn't have time for them. She wanted to do her art. That's the view from the, um, if, you're, if your back is to the house, that's the view and you can see where she was able to draw on nature. So, so you know, quickly right there in, in front of, of um, and in where she lived. This is the, the, the piece of the story that is so remarkable, the serendipity of her story, um, that she took her paintings down to a little drugstore in Hoosick Falls. This is the town today, a tiny little town in the hills. The drugstore was probably down there on the left corner. And she took her paintings down there. She tried to sell them at a country fair um, prior to this, but they didn't sell, only her homemade jam sold at the fair. Um, but somebody came by, a guy named Louis Caldor saw the paintings, liked the paintings, and took them into Manhattan and tried to find a dealer who was interested. He did in Otto Kallir at Gallery St. Antienne in the fall of 1939. And I went to interview Jane Kallir, Otto Kallir's granddaughter, herself an art historian and curator. And she told me that like um, Rousseau and others, Grandma Moses was a self-taught artist but at the time, quite a number of American art dealers were less interested in self-taught and more interested in sort of the, the more serious form of modernism they were seeing across the waters in Europe. But Otto Kallir, she said, um, a Jewish Austrian immigrant who fled in 1938 from Germany, from Austria, had a broader vision and he was not swayed by cultural prejudices like Yo-Yo Ma, the idea that he was open to new work and new visions. He took a liking to her work and in 1940 offered her first solo show. She was 80 years old um, and she, she then started a two decade career. The stamp you see on the right is an image of the 4th of July that she painted in 1951. It hung in the White House for quite some time, including decorating Caroline Kennedy's bedroom. Interestingly, new science shows that the aging brain and creativity can go together. Um, in a study of, of human brains that was done looking at donor brains of ages from 14 to 79, scientists found that although they weren't as spry as the younger counterparts, the, the older brains, they were surprised to found, find thousands of immature neurons in the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain involved in memory and learning. Now with longer lifespans, um, we have more time to make use of this brain power. And Moses herself, she painted 
some 1600 works in the final two decades of her life, her very long life until she died at 101. I started with Leonardo and I'm gonna close with Leonardo because I feel as if um, he's defined and, and sort of propelled my work and also is just such a um, outlier in the world of genius, the, the, um, the person who really speaks to all of these elements so incredibly in terms of his um, abilities and his, and his achievements. This is um, Amboise, France, the town in the Loire Valley where he lived his final few years. Clos Lucet, which is that modest, it was called Chateau up on the hill, um, I went to visit there. He had been offered a place by King Francis I in that town who gave him a stipend and the freedom to create whatever he wished. Um, and the colors and lights of this town, Amboise, were reminiscent of that town I showed you earlier where he was born in Vinci. He spent his final years working on a series of deluge drawings, mostly in black chalk, surging with intensity. And finally, the legacy. I think I mentioned that genius is defined by the legacy left behind, the imprint on future generations. And I'm gonna show you three images of um, people who have taken Leonardo's work in some way, um, or put differently, people whose Leonardo somehow found. I feel almost as if Leonardo's work kind of infiltrated their own in a way that was really remarkable. Uh, this is Francis Wells, who is a surgeon in Cambridge. Um, he came upon Leonardo's work in 1977 and said he was blown away by the sketches. He credits Leonardo with opening his eyes to the exquisite logic of the heart structure and the mechanics of the heart, not just what it looked like, but why it evolved the way it does. He took me into the surgical suite. He first showed me these images of Leonardo's drawing. He has written a book about Leonardo and then in the surgical suite motioned me over and showed me a valve in the heart and told me that he learned from the artist about why the valve is so intentional, um, is, is why, how, it, how it emerged to sustain the forces that are thrust upon it. And this has affected the way he approaches surgery. He tries to preserve as much as possible the valve um, of the original structure and it's and it's formatted his approach to the way he thinks about his work to look carefully to stop to think the way Leonardo always did. Another, um, the second one I want to show you a continent away. This is Stanford University. These doctoral students in the lab of David Lentick, um, the Codex on the Flight of Birds. Leonardo's work on birds really permeates this lab where they are working on some of the very queries that Leonardo posed hundreds of years ago. How does wing motion in air result in thrust? How do birds' muscles control the flapping of their wings? How do birds glide? And these students um, work working on a pigeon bot, they call it, which has feathered wings, um, designed on a computer, controlled by a computer, uh, very different from Leonardo's day, and yet the ideas um, and the interrogation and the imagination uh, are the same. And finally, music. Um, this is where I discovered Leonardo's lasting imprint, probably most profoundly at Kalmar Castle. You see it down at the left in Sweden. Um, in his notebooks, Leonardo had sketched ideas for an instrument that fused two musical families, keyboard and strings. And this handful of sketches was very preliminary. There were no blueprints, no real instructions, just just ideas, just whispers of thoughts. And this uh, musician, Sławomir Zubrzycki, a Polish pianist, discovered the sketches in 2009 and decided to build the instrument that Leonardo had envisioned in the 15th century, but never heard. He spent four years researching this, testing wood, choosing the kind of um, sp girl and spruce for the interior, resolving that he needed 61 keys and four circular bows covered in horsehair. And he said, I built it in order to play it. The instrument combines that polyphonic capacity of the keyboard so it can play multiple melodies at once with the sensitivity and the emotive range of strings. And it's just resounding and joyful. Um, when I listened to it, it reminded me of something I had learned about Leonardo's paintings, which is that he used a blurring technique, a blurring of the edges in his paintings called sfumato. 
and it lingers as a blurred edge. It allows the image um, to sort of continue to live in a way. And I felt as if this music, this instrument um, that this musician brought alive allowed a kind of musical luminescence that lingered. This is the lasting impact. And I just wanted to show this because the interest in this musical instrument, it just speaks to the idea that genius has a profound and lasting impact. And it speaks to the possibilities of potential. Um, the capacity of our brains to be enormously daring and creative and the long lasting beauty and legacy of genius. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm very happy to answer questions. Um, showing you here my website, please send any comments you would like or questions I love to hear from people. And if you would like um, autographed or inscribed book plates, I would be very delighted to send them to you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Miyako. I am the club admin for the DC based uh, Columbia Alumni Club. We are starting to get some questions coming in. If you guys have questions, go ahead and feel free to type them into the Q&A box, not the chat. I can control the question and answer a little bit easier if you do it in the Q&A. Um, so I'll go through here. It looks like everybody's listed as an anonymous viewer. So if you do want your name, college, anything like that, uh, just put it at the end of your question so I can and read that to uh, Claudia. Okay. All right. So our first question is that you alluded to the IQ uh, and its diminishing role as the ultimate indicator of a genius. Can you expand on the studies relevant to this? There are, this is a really interesting and also fraught area, as you can imagine, because um, IQ is a, a certain kind of test that tests a certain kind of intelligence. It does not, of course, test for elements or creativity. It doesn't test for imagination. It doesn't test for musical ability. There are many, many studies um, on IQ. The one that I was talking about was, was started by Lewis Terman out at Stanford in the 1920s, where he took these students that he tested who were either at genius or above, um, either the border of the genius number or above it, um, and followed them over these decades. And, and what it showed, as I mentioned, was that the IQ, it was not a determinant. It was not going to drive a person's um, life to genius or even necessarily to success. So I think the, the IQ studies are evolving even as we speak. There are people studying um, genes associated with intelligence, and there are other people looking at other forms of intelligence so that it's not so focused on one particular area. It's a, it's a fascinating area of study, um, and there are many, many interesting ways to think about intelligence um, outside of the IQ test. And I think there's more interest in doing that. The gene piece of it, I will just say, is um, very complex and very complicated. There are very few um, things in this world that are driven by single genes. Everything from behavior to intelligence is going to be a multitude of genetic forces. And then there's the nurture piece of it as well. So there's a, it's, it's complex. It's fascinating. Um, I'd be happy to communicate with whoever's interested in learning more about specific studies. We do have uh, some more questions on studies we'll get to a little bit later. Uh, but first we had a question on, is it possible that depending on the dominance of the left or right brain hemisphere, one could become a totally different kind of genius? Or do both sides attention to detail as well as having a holistic perspective need to be in balance? That's a great question. And again, it's a, you know, brain science is, is evolving. I kind of think of it as base camp on Everest. We're still really down there and we have so much more to learn. I, I will say two things about this question, which you've prompted me to think about. Um, one is that there is a lot of study on creativity in the brain. Where, how does the brain operate? Um, and how is the brain creative? Can we see that? Can we map it? Um, and, and one thing that's kind of come to light is that the, the middle part of the brain um, that communicates left to right, um, some early interesting looks, studies looking at how that might be more um, active in people who are more creative so that there's more communication going on between left and right brain um, at, at, um, together. Um, the idea of the left brain versus right brain is no longer um, the 
accepted truth. I think it's fair to say that um, nothing is completely only in one part of the brain versus the other. Um, but what is seeming to come about is this idea that there's the communication across the brain. There are networks of communication that are important and critical to things like creativity, and these are being studied um, right now. There's also some fascinating, the second thing I wanted to mention on the brain is there's some fascinating looks at um, savants, people who often have autism, um, who often called savants, who have incredible skills sometimes in numbers or in music, um, where there is often dam damage, excuse me, to the left side of the brain. And somehow, um, one of the wonderful researchers who studied this, um, Treffert, ca called this islands of genius that he believes we all have in our brains, but people who have damage on one side, in these cases, these savants he studied, are able to draw um, on the part of their brain that isn't damaged on the right side. So there's just fascinating um, elements. I'm not sure if I answered that question, but it prompted me to think of um, the, the many wonderful ways in which the brain works and is being studied currently. Uh, we have a couple questions I'm going to uh, put together here. Uh, somebody asked about the unprecedented explosion of original work and Nobel worthy research in Europe, especially from German scientists um, from like 1890 to 1930. And so do you suspect particular social drivers may aid people in realizing their genius? Um, and then the second question, which I think is related, Jeanette says that you mentioned the depression and the bubonic plague and these intense periods when geniuses flourish. So do you think we might see an explosion of prodigies because of our current pandemic? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I hope so. <laughs> I hope that our um, current pandemic leads to an explosion of, of creativity and imagination. And I think um, that is indeed possible. Um, these explosions of work, I mean, sometimes I think uh, it's fair to say it, it's not always um, as noticed as it is in the periods where, where, where there's the attention paid, but the periods of the depression or the pre-war periods, the periods where, yes, I think there are social drivers, there are elements that come together. Um, like in the case of Picasso, he had not only the mentors and not only the nourishing, the family that sort of raised him um, to a high level in terms of his art, but also um, the peers and the interaction among scientists, among artists and um, musicians and people in Paris in that era, um, all driving and almost competing with one another, just jostling with their intellectual creativity. And then in, in Leonardo in the, um, the Renaissance, um, also people, you know, the arts then were respected as a funded source of, of opportunity. They had money, they could do things, and they came up against each other and wanted to potentially outdo or outbid for jobs. I mean, there was there's a lot of drivers that can um, push um, genius to, to the fore. And um, I think it's a, it's a really interesting subject to study, for sure. I, I, f I forgot the second part, I'm sorry, of um, the question, but maybe I... Oh, no, you got it. It was, it, do, will we see more now in this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, so we have a question from Sarah Wilson, who is Law School 90. She asked, what about post uh, posthumously discovered genius? So what factors contribute to social recognition of genius? Yeah, that's a really, really wonderful um, question that raises all sorts of, of other questions about how do we identify genius and how often is it overlooked? And not only that, but how often do potential geniuses, are there um, overlooked geniuses? Are there people in the world who live in places where poverty and other um, difficult you know, issues make it impossible for them? to be nurtured, to find mentors, to elevate themselves above. And I think there, um, there is a lot to say about that, that it is, most genius um, is recognized in many ways after death. And the reason it is, is more um, in a way easy to identify and, and name a genius, if you're gonna do that after death, is that you can see the impact on people for generations later. So you have a way to kind of, um, look at the the work of the genius not only in his or her lifetime but later all that said i think you know there there are a lot of interesting elements around women and and you know underprivileged and w what's happening to the pieces um the people there and how are they going to get elevated up potentially to um even if it's not even if we don't use the word genius and and that's a whole nother conversation 
Um, but how do you um, how do you do that? I, I'm I talked with one wonderful math researcher um, at, at Ken Ono who was working on a project where he's doing a search for um, mathematical minds and using the internet as a way to reach out and getting people to um, where he can give money and find mentors for people around the world who might otherwise not be discovered. So there's work going on to do that. Uh, well, I mentioned we had a question about studies. So I did want to ask that, can you say anything else about studies that you mentioned on the benefits of introducing students to stories of difficulty or failure on the way to success? Right, so I don't, I don't have all the details at my fingertips of that study, but um, what I found most remarkable about it is that these were students who did have challenges in school. And the idea was if they could identify with people's um, failures and difficulties, things that they themselves had been through, would it help motivate them to actually do better in school versus only hearing about their successes? Because that could be something unattainable for them. If they only know a genius is a genius, how's that going to work for somebody studying in New York City who doesn't necessarily have that kind of, or wherever it is, who doesn't have that kind of um, necessarily um, environment? or mentor or teacher. So this is such an interesting study because these kids did do better when they were told about these struggles and these, in some cases, um, difficulties. I don't, again, I wish I had all the details at my fingertips. It's a really interesting study done at Columbia um, Teaching College, actually. So Columbia Link, um, and I would be happy to send that out to anybody who would who would like to look, look at it. I do also know that colleges um, have started looking at this notion kind of failure and struggles and doing programs on it um, sometimes at the beginning of, of, of school to say let's talk about this if we don't acknowledge that failure is part of the journey we won't be able to handle it and move on uh, there's a podcast that I listen to called How I Built This by NPR, yeah. <laughs> uh, Kai Raz, and he, they ask at the end of every episode whether their success was due to uh, skill or luck, and usually, and I think they interviewed uh, Sarah Blakely, um, it's usually a combination, but they all kind of acknowledge there was a lot of luck involved. Um, yeah. But we have somebody who asked how important is just simply being confident. Right. Um, I think it's important. I do think that it is one of those things that people learn to assume um, in a way, to, to be intentional about. I, I mentioned Maya Angelou talking about being a contrived optimist. And I think you can also, in some ways, learn to contrive your confidence. I don't think it's easy. Um, and I think when people have um, experiences that work against that, it can be very difficult. Eleanor Roosevelt, as a child, her mother um, was a very beautiful woman. And Eleanor, in her memoir, writes about how difficult it was being her daughter, that she um, felt that her mother didn't think she was pretty enough. And this became, this this one issue became a big one for her. Um, and she had a real lack of confidence about it. But in her way, you know, once she did find a mentor who believed in her and was able to cultivate um, those experiences, she was able to, to gradually grow that confidence. So I think it's one of those things that it is important to success, but I don't think you know, you can look at somebody like Picasso and you would say in there you had almost an overconfidence. You had a sense of um, an ego that was that was really large and played a big role in his in his work. But then you also have somebody um, like Alexander Fleming, who was, I would say, quietly confident, but not not a sense of bravado. I don't think I think confidence can be um, can come in different forms. And he was always very modest and always deflecting praise and, and, and that kind of thing. So I think it, it plays a role, but I don't think there's any one way to be confident. Uh, well, speaking of the people in your book, we had a question from Melanie on how did you decide on how to narrow down who would be included? Um, and then we had a, a separate question from Susan Fitzgibbon who says, was Sarah Blakely a reluctant interviewee? She's among some tough company. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll answer the first. Sarah Blakely um, was actually, once I was able to 
get through her people and track her down. And she does have a lot going on and she's a busy, busy business person, but she was a wonderful and not at all reluctant interviewee. She was absolutely delighted um, to share her story and participate. And I think somewhat awed by the company she was going to find herself in. Um, I really wanted to, the reason I chose her and the others in the book, in her case, I was looking for somebody who would be a little bit surprising, who was a contemporary figure, who was a woman in business. And I had heard her story on how I built this, the podcast you mentioned, and was really taken by it. I thought that she was really interesting in the way she talked about how um, she started her company and, and, and her whole experience with, with failure and how she um, worked through it. So the others, I wanted a kind of a um, different uh, livelihood for each chapter. So not all business people, not all uh, musicians or artists. So I wanted a real broad array so that each chapter, you would not only learn about a person and that person's biography um, and life journey, but also a, a different kind of field, um, whether it was science or art or Shirley Temple's entertainment. Um, and I wanted a span of history to, to look at. So going from, um, you know, Isaac Newton all the way up to contemporary figures, Yo-Yo Ma, being able to give people a sense of history also, because that allowed me to explore the idea of genius and the elements in achievement over time. So it was a lot of culling the list. I, I kind of had an idea that I wanted who, who would be a good person in science. And for that, I thought um, immediately of, of Isaac Newton, but there are, of course, others. Uh, I wanted to balance women with men and obviously could have gone to other women scientists, but decided in the end that I was interested in the story of um, Julia Child because she's a midlifer. So, you know, I needed to balance the prodigy midlife and late life. So it's kind of a pieces of a puzzle. <laughs> Great. So we have a few more questions. We still have about 20 minutes left if you guys want to keep adding your questions in. Um, so we have one that says you mentioned grit as one of the characteristics of genius. And they say, would this be better explained as delusion? meaning that a genius will continue on a path where standard projection and expectation of the return on investment would push a rational person to abandon all efforts. That's very interesting. Um, I think that, um, I don't know, I've never, I've never thought of it as a delusion, but it would be an interesting um, aspect to explore in the sense that you're right. I mean, there could be a um, expectation that you can achieve something that's really beyond um, achievement that you were going, as you say, that you're going to, you know, push a rational person to just abandon it. Um, I don't, I don't quite see it that way. I think grit um, is a kind of stick to that comes from probably other kinds of um, elements that, that come together. So it's, um, it's, it's a high energy, it's a determination, it's perhaps an experience in childhood. I mentioned that sometimes trauma can can push some people to want to achieve, maybe in some cases to overachieve, to get past difficulties. Um, so I think that's a really interesting question. I, I think I would I would be interested in in maybe uh, psychologists or behavioral scientists looking at it. I think it could be. Um, and delusion, of course, has sort of a negative connotation to it, but it, it could be interesting to explore it and see if there is any kind of connection. I I tend to think of it more as a as a positive attribute um, in terms of the, that kind of ability to put one foot in front of the other and move forward. I, I know that um, just many of these people I studied, and I think I mentioned it um, with some of them, with Eleanor Roosevelt and with others, there was a real sense, I know Shirley Temple, another one, of um, we, cannot, we cannot live in the past. We need to continue to put one foot forward. When Shirley Temple finished her acting she was her father was in charge of her uh, financial um her money and when she finished she finished acting in her early 20s ultimately um she discovered that most of the money was gone um that the money had been at sometimes loaned out it had been sent to family there were there were real questions about it. and she refused to get bogged down in this issue um, a lot of people would have potentially um, had real problems with this. This was, she had some money, but not nearly as much as she might have, but she said it was just, she just moved ahead. Um, and that's how she described it in, in her autobiography. So I think there's just an ability to um, have, to, to be courageous and, and to look forward. 
So I think I would I would frame it in a more positive light. Oh, well, to take the darker side, um, <laughs> Dominique says, is there any evidence through studies of a correlation between genius uh, and depression or suicide? Yeah, they're, they're, genius or any kind of um, achievement, um, creativity has been associated with mental health conditions in some people. So for example, um, especially with mood disorders, depression and bipolar disorder, anxiety um, have been found to be associated with people in the arts. So writers, um, people um, who are creative and um, K. Redfield Jamison has done a lot of really interesting work on this and you can can read her books, but it's a, it's a really interesting question. There's no science that absolutely gives you a cause and effect. So even though there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that genius is often touched by madness, you often hear that, that there is an element um, of that in people whose minds work in different ways, but there's also people who have achieved and successfully who don't have <clears throat> excuse me, those, those same challenges. So I think it's, 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 it's an interesting area of study. And there is, um, in certain conditions, there are for sure links to uh, risk of suicide. And those do appear in things like mood disorders or borderline personality disorders, which could be associated with the work of geniuses. So whether you can say a genius is um, more prone to one of these conditions and or more at risk for something like suicide. I don't think you can based on the science currently, but there's associations and anecdotal stories that say that it certainly does exist. And you often hear of, um, there's, there's musicians that have been known to have these very dark periods where they actually don't work at all, um, severe depressions and then come back, mania coming into, the, into play in, in terms of creative surges. Um, so, you know, I think of mental health really as, as a spectrum that we're, we all exist on um, and everybody has certain elements of many of these things um, to some degree in small amounts perhaps and then in some cases really significant and difficult amounts. But there are some writers, for example, who will say it's the mania that drives their, their output and um, they will not take medication because they're concerned about their creativity being dampened. And at the same time, um, there are others who will say, it's the medication that's allowed me to be creative. It's given me um, the stability I need to, to do my work. So I think the, this is also a really, really fascinating area. And in my first book, I talk a lot about these different conditions that um, people have and yet still achieve greatness. It doesn't mean their lives are easy by any means. In fact, they're often quite difficult. Um, and I think within, if you're talking about genius and you're talking about somebody who's alive as a genius, which isn't always the case, as I mentioned, sometimes it's almost, it's always, it is often later that they're recognized, but the sense of expectation and um, heaped upon them can also, of course, affect people. So it's, um, our minds work um, with our emotions and our behaviors, it's all tangled up. Well, we have a couple questions uh, on kids and, and designer babies. So a couple of questions on the youth here. Uh, Takashi Uchida asks, what do you think the future of level and key criteria of genius when future humans start to make designer babies? Do you just think the average level of genius is increasing or higher geniuses will be ignited among pre-genius levels? Yeah, um, this is obviously a really, I mean, this question is something I think about for sure a lot. I think a lot of people do think about it. We're now at a stage when um, we can test, um, you know, babies even in the womb for um, genetic testing and infants for genetic testing, you can you can be at the point where you're testing um, an embryo for a medical condition. Um, if you have a Huntington and your Huntington's in your family and you, you create an embryo that has Huntington's, you may choose not to take that embryo and implant it versus a healthy embryo. We are at the point where we're doing that. We're doing that for medical reasons. But now the question is, do you go anywhere near doing that for anything other than 
um, a fatal disease or a difficult, you know, some kind of condition, condition like Huntington's. Um, I, I don't know. I think the, the question around being able to identify genius is so complicated. And, and if you did, if you could do a gene test for genius, that would be one thing. But the reality is that um, being able to identify genius, what would you test for? So you can't test for, for luck and creativity and, and um, persistence and that kind of thing. You can test for intelligence, but you can't really, at this point, identify all of the genes that are associated with intelligence. You can't choose, can't go into a baby's genome or an embryo genome and look at the genes and say, this kid's gonna be really smart. Down the line, I think it's um, for sure something that everybody um, who deals with medical ethics wrestles with because designer babies are a big concern. If they can help people with Huntington's, that's one thing, but moving on to an issue of um, intelligence or ability or achievement or genius. I don't know how to even answer the question of what the level of genius might be. I think that's still, we still don't know enough about um, brain science. And you know, the, the reality is that to really understand the brain of a genius, you have to do a um, scientific study where you have a collection of brains. One group is genius, one group isn't. You have those brains to study and you can compare them. Well, the reality is we don't we don't have that. They studied Einstein's brain. There aren't enough geniuses to do that study living today. Um, they took Einstein's brain and um, studied it and found a few small differences that were sort of interesting. But what do you compare that to and how do you know? Um, so that's not a it's not a you can't you can't necessarily come up with any conclusion. So I think it's very hard to be able to at this point identify you know, anything like genius um, in the brain and thus be able to craft it um, or, or select for it in a baby. But it's, let's see, in 50 years, I mean, it's something that is definitely being watched. I don't think we'll ever get to, the, I think there's too many other influences and too many other genetic components um, that work together and then the environmental influences that you could ever really do that. But whether you could sharpen something to sharpen certain genes, maybe. Uh, so we had a person comment that Leonardo was infamous for not completing commissioned or organized work. Um, and some of his sketches and ideas were never completed as composed textbooks uh, because of this. So do you think of this as a handicap for geniuses like da Vinci? Uh, and then a follow up question is, is that how would you encourage young gifted students who have multiple interests. So should they focus on one? Should they be allowed to kind of explore all the different ones like Leonardo did? Oh, those are great questions. So um, yes, Leonardo was, I mean, he did not, <laughs> he, was, he didn't complete his works and they drove people absolutely crazy. Um, so this is such an interesting piece of his life. I talked to one uh, art expert who told me that this was a part of, he was much more interested in the process than in the finished product. And for him, the process was the important piece. He needed to understand anatomy. He needed to understand all these sketches where he was working through um, the way that his visualization of um, things, whether it was how, how water flowed or how a leaf on a plant grew. You know, he had to sketch to understand. And so he, he worked and he worked and he worked at that. Whereas his paintings, many of them he did not finish. Um, but, you know, you could, he was also somebody who never saw them finished. So I think in that sense, probably a perfectionist who could not allow them um, to leave his, his, his grip in some ways. So I don't know if, if it, it's interesting question, was it a handicap for somebody like him? Um, for the most part, they, they seem to put up with it um, and allow him, especially at the end of his life when he was given this chance to go to France and just do whatever he wanted to do. It was his, it was his dream because the pressure of completing was always a problem for him. He, he never thought anything was complete and he um, intentionally focused on the process, not the product. Um, and I think in that second question on this idea of, of multiple interests, somebody, um, a number of people I talked to in the field of genius talk about the importance actually of those many interests that if you are so focused on a single subject that you don't often get the um, exposure and the ability to challenge your own mind in other ways. And so they find that um, 
many of the people who exceeded in some areas also had other interests and hobbies. For example, Einstein liked to sail. Well, that was one of his hobbies, and he was also a violinist. Um, these are things that he needed apparently to sort of cultivate his own mind and give himself a break from, or maybe think through his thoughts on on physics. So that, um, but sometimes these these different domains can spark ideas one across the other. I think about it almost um, as if you need that extra complexity um, to force yourself to think in different ways. You can learn about math from studying art um, and you, you can learn a lot about um, other subjects um, in science, you know, other subjects that are completely different, but that relate. Um, Fleming was interestingly somebody who in the lab, they used colors a lot. And he began to appreciate the use of color and began to make um, little paintings out of colored, I, I think they were, can't remember exactly what the, the source was, but these were elements from the lab that he made paintings out of so that he was able to explore um, his own lab work in an artistic way. So I think that would be encouraged. And in, in, I think there's too much pressure in this day and age to focus um, specifically on a single thing. And I think the people who study these great minds would say, um, don't, don't do that because it could be detrimental. I'm going to combine a couple questions here for our, our last one. Um, you've mentioned um, kind of the spectrum of, of confidence for geniuses, some who are more modest, um, some who are a lot more arrogant. So do you see that that kind of falls on one side or the other? And then another question kind of, are they, for those who are alive when they are kind of recognized as geniuses, is it, are they happier? Are they less happy? Is it related to money, upbringing, kind of just how do they fall out on that spectrum and, and what influences some of them? Yeah. Um, so I think, I think it, there really is a range. I think that um, you do see that arrogance in, in some genius minds. And it's, a, it's, a, it's something that um, I know with Picasso, it was almost as if um, the, the, he was so caught up in his own mind and his own art that everything else became tools for him. You know, his, his, the many women in his life, life became his, his muses and his models and everything was about the art and he worked incessantly at it and he, um, his ego drove him in that way. I think, you know, if you're talking about um, different kinds of fields, there may be a different element of that where I mentioned Fleming being, being modest. Um, they, I think they do fall on different kinds of the spectrum. I think there was a study, in fact, of artists which showed that um, there can the more the more successful ones do have larger egos, and I think this study, and I'm sorry I don't have the details at my fingertips, was based on um, looking at the size of signatures and the way their signatures appeared on paintings, and what a signature could tell you about a person's confidence and, and ego, and that there seemed to be a possible link um, between ego and success in art. But I think this is all areas um, of study, and I don't know that there's a huge amount of re conclusive research on it. Um, I do think it's it's an. I think that if you have a strong confidence and a strong inner core and a strong um, ego, you're starting a few steps ahead. Um, but I don't think you necessarily have to have that to achieve. And I think I think different fields certainly work differently. Um, so you'd have to kind of investigate each one separately and then and then compare. Okay, well, we had a bunch of questions that we didn't get to, but um, I did want to say that we recorded this uh, event and we will be sharing the link tomorrow. So if you had any issues, uh, make sure you check your spam folder or just go to our YouTube channel. That's where all of our events are posted. Um, we did have a question if you know where the Teachers College uh, study um, is. We had a couple questions asking for the link to that. So Okay. Uh, oh, if people could um, just go to my website, uh, ClaudiaCalb.com and go to contact, you can send me a note and I would be more than happy to send you the links to the study. Perfect. All right. And then maybe if you can give us a little bit of uh, closing thoughts and um, places that we can go to continue thinking about this. So blogs or websites, podcasts, anything to kind of let us keep thinking about this topic after we read your book, which we will <laughs> 
Um, well, first of all, thank you very much to Columbia and to all of you for organizing this. It's been really great to be here and it's been nice to revisit Columbia after my days at SIPA quite a few years ago. <laughs> um, but I, um, there's, there's lots of wonderful work out there. Um, it's, it's hard to um, name individually. Um, I'm thinking of names off the top of my head, but there are a lot of books. You can, can you read everything from sort of the popular science um, like Malcolm Gladwell, or you can read Walter Isaacson's books where he profiles geniuses like um, including Leonardo and Einstein. Um, but they're also, I would say, one of the most interesting things to do is, is look at primary sources of people that you're interested in that are geniuses. So you can go on now, thanks to the internet, and, and look up the letters that um, people wrote. You know, Isaac Newton wrote um, documents, Marie Curie. You know, you can look up wonderful things, uh, correspondence by artists that might interest you and, and kind of go to those um, sources that are really right there at your fingertips now that you can that you can dig into that wasn't really doable um, a number of, of decades ago. I think that's really a wonderful part of researching great minds. Um, but there are a lot of other books. There's a book that came out on prodigies, um, which if I can um, don't have it right at my fingertips. Came out a couple of years ago. I apologize, um, but there's the, I can I can certainly answer questions, and I could also send you a link. Um, there's a researcher named um, Dean Keith Simonton, who, if there is a head guru in the genius field, this is him. Um, he's out of California, and he's written everything from very academic books, which are very hefty. He's edited chapters and chapters on genius. Um, to books that are much more um, user-friendly to the point. I think he wrote something called Genius 101 or something like that, Genius for Dummies, which actually includes a lot of interesting information. So there's a lot of, of that kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of interesting work on um, the kinds of things that evolve around the question of genius that um, should we even be talking about genius? You know, there's the um, people who think um, that's not necessarily um, the right thing to do, that genius creates an expectation that, that we can't deliver. So there's just so much in the field. I think the best thing for me to do would be to put together a list of resources, which I'd be happy to do. And I can either send it to you or I could um, answer people individually on my website or maybe post it on my website so people could go. There's plenty to read. Yeah, if you um, send it to us, uh, we can share that when we send out the link to the recording as well. Oh, okay. Perfect. I will do that. Great. Thank you so much. We have a bunch of people writing in thanking you for your time. This was a really interesting talk. Um, I know I learned a lot and I'm definitely going to go pick up some more books to continue reading. So thank you so thank you. much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.